Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the World Affairs Council Foreign Policy Panel. We're delighted you're here this evening for a timely discussion on the status of the Iran and international negotiations on the nuclear issues that face not only Iran, but our world. I'm delighted tonight that we're joined by the chairperson of the World Affairs Council DC, Edie Frazier, the president of STEM Connector, and the first female in 35 years to be chairperson of the World Affairs Council Board of Directors, Edie. Also pleased that we have a number of our board members and supporters here tonight, as well as our distinguished panel. An opportunity earlier tonight to talk with Ambassador Limber. You have read the biographies, I hope, that there are, have been available to everyone who's been here tonight, so I'm not going to repeat verbatim what's on those biographies. What I would like to say is that Ambassador Limburg has received the highest award for valor that the U.S. Department of State can give. He was one of the brave Americans who had, in his own words, an extended stay in Iran uh, when the Ayatollah came in to change the management of the Hotel Tehran. And so, welcome to Ambassador Limburg, a distinguished diplomat and someone who is, in terms of public service to the United States and the international community, earned, earned plaudits throughout the world. So, Thank you. Our second guest is pinch hitting as his boss, is uh, just arrived back from Switzerland, not in time to be here tonight, but Jamal Abidi is the uh, a policy director for the National Iranian American Council. We are delighted that his voice is part of this dialogue tonight. Jamal, I shared with you that although I'm an Irishman, I've been to Iran three times. And I was very proud when I went to the gates of the British Embassy and saw a very large brass sign that said, Welcome, Embassy of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. On the other side, there was an equally large brass plate that said, Bobby Sands Avenue. <laughs> and for those of you who know Irish history, it was the Iranian way of communicating a message to the British, although they may have owned the embassy and the land that it was on, they owned the street. <laughs> our next guest tonight, our moderator, is uh, an extremely well-known Washingtonian, also a proud member of the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists that's a strategic partner of our World Affairs Council DC. Barbara Slavin, I heard you last night for half an hour on National Public Radio. I've heard you throughout the day on multiple, both uh, radio and TV programs. Your depth of knowledge with regard to the nation and the region that we're talking about tonight and its dialogue with the United States is superb, and we are fortunate to have you as our moderator tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator for the evening, Barbara Slavin, with one admonition to this audience. Don't be shy when it comes to question time. The World Affairs Council DC is a leading institution dedicated to global education, international affairs, and global communications. It's a place where learning happens. I know with this panel and with this moderator tonight, we will learn a lot and you have a rare opportunity while the iron is hot in these negotiations to get some answers to some of the questions 
that I think all of the world is interested in with respect to the impact of the outcome of the negotiations in Switzerland. Barbara? Thank you very much, and thank you for the, the gracious introduction. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, we had a, a wonderful session, actually, with, with Trita and John uh, about a year and a half ago when Iran and the United States and the other members of the permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany reached an interim agreement that put verifiable curbs on Iran's nuclear program while they tried to negotiate a comprehensive long-term agreement. Now, those of you who've been following the news know that it's not been easy going. We're now into a full week in this latest round of talks in Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, and there were hopes that perhaps the negotiators would meet a March 31st deadline for some kind of political framework or understanding that would govern the talks until the real deadline, which is June 30th of this year. Uh, as we speak, of course, negotiators are still hard at work in Switzerland into the night, and if you are on Twitter or social media, you will see many very grumpy comments by my uh, colleagues there, particularly <laughs> in the press corps, who are sitting around waiting, as we all are waiting, to find out whether they will succeed in coming up with a political framework. I'm going to sketch very briefly where we are in the talks, and then I'm going to turn to our our eminent panelists. Uh, I think progress has clearly been made. They wouldn't be still in Switzerland talking if they hadn't made progress. Uh, most of the, the concepts, the, the contours of a deal, I think, have already been agreed to. But the devil is always in the details, as they say. And for Iran, the key issue now is sanctions relief and in particular, relief of United Nations sanctions. There are six UN resolutions, four of them have sanctions in them, that have been passed since 2006. And these sanctions lay the basis for all of the economic penalties that have been put on Iran over its nuclear program since 2006. They also signify that Iran is a pariah in the eyes of the international community, something which makes the Iranians very, very upset, needless to say. And they are insisting on rapid removal of UN penalties in return for accepting long-term restrictions on their nuclear program. My understanding is that what is at stake now is a f at least a 15-year agreement that would prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons through a variety of pathways. Some aspects of the deal would expire before 15 years, but many of them would continue through 15 years. And after that, Iran would remain a member of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which means that it is obliged not to develop nuclear weapons. So the issue of sanctions relief is key. On other issues, they've made a lot of progress. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those issues with our speakers and also in the Q&A. I think the Iranians have agreed to reduce the number of centrifuges that they currently have installed uh, to perhaps 6,000 or even fewer that would be operating. They've agreed to limit the stockpile of low-enriched uranium that they could hold on to, whether they would send it out of the country or somehow dilute it uh, into a different form. That's something that's still being discussed. They've agreed to modify uh, a reactor, a heavy water reactor under construction at a place called Arak. A-R-A-K, which could produce plutonium, which is another potential bomb fuel. They've agreed not to enrich uranium at Fordo, which is an underground facility. They may do some other kind of work there, but it will not be enrichment of uranium. And they have agreed to extraordinary, unprecedented verification measures, which would give the international community confidence that Iran is not trying to sneak out to a bomb not trying to find a covert pathway to a bomb. Altogether, this is a pretty good package. But we are in the end game now. The final deadline is June the 30th. The Iranians have not wanted to uh, have a two-stage process. They basically want to have one agreement which will be announced at one time. The way I've referred to it is an analogy to the Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s when Ayatollah Khomeini, then the leader of the revolution, said he would accept a ceasefire that left Saddam Hussein in place, but he compared that to drinking poison. 
And Ayatollah Khamenei, who is the current supreme leader of Iran, wants to drink the poison in one, one go. He doesn't want to have two doses of it. So we have a fight also over what kind of statement is going to come out of this round of talks. How specific will it be? The United States, of course, wants a more specific statement because they don't have to just worry about the other negotiating partners in Iran. They have to worry about the U.S. Congress, which is breathing heavily down President Barack Obama's neck. And so these are some of the issues that have kept these uh, individuals uh, in Switzerland staying up all night for two or three nights in a row. Uh, we will see whether they get there tomorrow or it takes another day. We will see what they come up with. But I'm going to start by asking John Limbert uh, to talk about the calculations of uh, the Iranians to some extent and also what he thinks Congress is going to demand from the administration in order to stave off new legislation that could make it more complicated for the White House to negotiate a comprehensive agreement. Thank you, Bar thank you, Barbara, and thank you, Tony, for that, again, very generous uh, and gracious introduction. I have just one question for you. Um, when you were on Avenue Bobby Sands in Tehran, did you go to the Bobby Sands snack bar, <laughs> which is located right around the corner from the uh, British Embassy? Regrettably, no, but I understand the sandwiches there are very well done. Yes, <laughs> it's a certain <laughs> irony, of course, in the name, isn't it? Yes, since he, he, he died on a hunger strike, I believe. Yes, right. yes, okay. That's right. Very, very good. So I'm going to um, I'm speak very briefly and then uh, we'll have a lot of time. I know we have a lot of time for questions. My experience is there are always lots of questions and very good and, and, and very good ones. Uh, put a couple of qu put two questions up front. Where are we, and where are we going with this with this process? Well, where are we right now? We I think we're in double overtime <laughs> right now. Where are we go where are we going? That's the hard that's that's the hard question. Our Iranian friends like to say uh, there are only two possibilities as Dohal Khadej needs. Either, either we get to a deal or we don't get to a deal. So there are only two possible, really two, uh, um, uh, two outcomes. But why, um, and I think what we need to do tonight is take a, take a breath, step back a little bit uh, from talks about uh, breakouts, triggers, snapbacks, UN resolutions, centrifuges, subterfuges, all that sort of thing, um, and look at something a little bit bigger. And one question that I would put out here is, why has this been so hard? Why is this so difficult? It's been 13 months, it's been 18 months since the first, since the, since the first agreement. Uh, well, one reason is that for better or worse, the two sides decided that they were going to take on in the negotiation what is, I think, one of the hardest issues between us and the, Iran and the Iranians. I mean, what makes it, and what makes it so hard? It's not the, it's not the technical part of it. I mean, uh, Secretary Munez and Mr. Salehi uh, could probably talk MIT to each other um, and reach an agreement. Now, I wouldn't understand a word of it, but they could reach an they they could reach an agreement if the issues were technical, but they're not tech. But they're but they're not technical. Um, what we have instead are asymmetrical negotiations, in which the two sides are simply talking about different things. Uh, the U.S. side talks about obligations. We talk about treaties and we and legal issues. The Iranians are talking about justice, they're talking about our rights, and they're talking about national dignity. And the result has been frustration, because each side in a situation like that says, well, they're not listening to us. They're not listening to what we say. Now there's a, let me, let me do a, I'm a historian by training, so let me, I love, and I, so I, I can't resist talking about history here. There is a history on this. Uh, this kind of mutual deafness 60 years ago sank negotiations between the British and the Iranians over the status of the Iranian oil industry, the, the oil nationalization controversy. 
The Iranian side argued its rights, its national dignity. They said, it's our oil. We have the right to control it. The other side argued contracts, le legalisms, and as one British observer said, I quote, really, it seemed hardly fair that dignified and correct Western statesmanship should be defeated by the antics of incomprehensible Orientals. <laughs> well, that's where they were. That's where they were. That's how the sides saw, uh, 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 saw each other. And the result, as we know, is the disgraceful history of August 1953, the CIA-sponsored, British-sponsored coup that overthrew uh, the government of uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh, which few Americans know about and every Iranian knows about, uh, uh, knows about and which still casts its shadow over to the meetings, the meeting rooms in Lausanne. Like it or not, that shadow is there. And I fear that that sad history is repeating itself. As I tell my students uh, at the Naval Academy, those who forget history are condemned to repeat sophomore year. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's the bad news. Let me end with some good news. Let me end with some good news. And, th and then I, I know Jamal will, I want to hear what Jamal has to say and get into the discussion. Uh, the good news is that the U.S. and Iran we have come a very long way in the last two years, in a good way. I mean, deal or no deal, um, we have finally, both sides, I think, have finally realized that the last three decades of trading accusations, insults, threats, and sometimes worse, uh, have accomplished nothing for either side. I mean, if, you, if all you can do is thump your chest, uh, after 30 years of thumping your chest, the result is, of course, a so sore chest. <laughs> and we are slowly and tentatively embarking on a better way. It's not the way of friendship, but it's the way of two states uh, that neither like nor trust each other. And I emphasize that. I emphasize that because we don't. We don't. Uh, but which have matters to talk about. And when Secretary Kerry sits, meets with Foreign Minister Zarif, um, they call their talks positive and productive. Now, this may sound ordinary to you, but these words carry tremendous symbolic power. Because think about it, when was the last time any encounter between Iran and the United States described as either positive or productive. You'd have to go back over 36 years to find what, back before the Islamic Revolution, uh, to find such an encounter. So, tomorrow, the day after, there, there will be a deal or there will not be a deal, as I said. Two possibilities, only two possibilities. Uh, but at least, I will say this, our two countries have spotted a path out of the, that swamp of hostility where we've been stuck for so long. The hard part, of course, is getting on that path and then staying on it. Well, thank you, and I look, very much look forward to our discussion. Thank you, John, that was well put. I, I would just add that in terms of these negotiations, uh, I have always seen the Iranian nuclear program to some extent as a massive bargaining chip for the Iranian regime. This is their ticket back into the international community. And so I think one of the reasons why these negotiations are so hard is that you can only play this card once. And Iran wants to make sure that it gets the maximum in return and that it's not going to be cheated. And one of the reasons, Jamal, why, why Iran is worried about being cheated is because of the U.S. Congress. They are deathly afraid that they will agree to put these restrictions on the nuclear program, and then Congress will impede a deal, will prevent the Obama administration or its successor from implementing a deal. So if you could talk a little bit about the dynamics in Congress and what you think John Kerry and his negotiating team need to come up with in Lausanne or Geneva, if they move there, 
in order to stave off uh, congressional opposition. Thanks, Barbara. Um, and thanks to World Affairs Council, and it's of course an honor to be up here with Ambassador Limbert and uh, Barbara, who is one of the best journalists who's, who've been working on Iran for uh, the past over a decade. Um, now, Congress, Congress, the, the branch of government uh, that we all can look towards for thoughtful, reasonable debate on the issues, and who absolutely should be, uh, you know, these 535 members of Congress should be inserted into a negotiation that already includes seven countries, including the United States, uh, Russia, uh, and Iran. Uh, and, and Congress should, would, would definitely play a positive role if they injected themselves into this situation we have. Um, this is the argument that some in Congress are trying to make. Uh, right now, you know, there, Congress has an important role to play. What is Congress's role so far? Well, Congress has passed sanctions on Iran, uh, especially since 2010. Uh, basically, since Obama came into office, uh, with the exception of his first year, 2009, Congress has passed major sanctions legislation every single year until just recently when the interim agreement with Iran was struck. Uh, these are major sanctions. These are quote unquote crippling sanctions. And these are sanctions that many in Congress argue, I think over argue, uh, are key to uh, what brought Iran to the table. Now I think that's a much more, there's a much more nuanced debate that has to occur around that. But what I don't think can be debated is that sanctions do provide um, a form of leverage in these talks. This is, these sanctions have become what the talks are about on our side. Iran makes compromises on its nuclear program. We trade in these massive sanctions that we've piled onto Iran, and that's the deal. That's the, the premise. The problem is, how do you convince Congress to actually trade in these sanctions? Is Congress a reasonable, rational actor who, if given a good deal, if given, presented with a deal, that does what the sanctions were set out to accomplish, which was prevent Iran from getting a nuclear program, uh, a nu sorry, a nuclear weapon. It wasn't necessarily to address every single issue we have with Iran. There are some sanctions tied to terrorism. There are some sanctions tied to human rights. But by and large, these were supposed to be nuclear sanctions. And so anybody making the argument that sanctions brought Iran to the table, you would assume would then accept the argument that once Iran is at the table, we have to be prepared to trade those sanctions in. So that brings us to today, where we are not even talking about sanctions being lifted, at least at the outset of this deal. We're talking about getting a deal in which the sanctions are temporarily suspended, the US sanctions, are temporarily suspended with waivers that Congress built into the sanctions so that the President can, on a six-month basis, waive the sanctions, um, and then you assume that his successor does the same thing, and we repeat this for a number of years, and then eventually, you know, five, six, ten years down the line, Congress would take action to lift the sanctions. Now we have letters coming out of Congress and legislation coming out of Congress implying that that's not going to happen. And this inherently undermines any leverage that, he, that the United States has at the negotiating table. We are essentially, our negotiators are going to the negotiations and saying, you do, you do the, the compromising on the nuclear side of things, and then we'll take care of Congress and get Congress to lift sanctions down the road. And it's not even going to be President Obama. It's going to be his successor. This is a tough argument to make. It's, it's, it, it, it only exacerbates the lack of trust between the US and Iran. So I think my sense is that from the beginning of these talks, it was almost taken for granted that Congress was not going to lift these sanctions and that there was going to have to be a way not just to deal with Iran's hardliners, which we know are intransigent, we know, you know, part of, the, part of their, uh, you know, uh, the, their adage is, you know, that we can't deal with the United States and, and, and sort of their, a lot of their political power comes from the dispute with the United States. But we also have to be mindful of the hardliners in the United States who would never lift these sanctions. And so I think the deal that's being constructed takes that into account and attempts to ensure that if hardliners in, in Iran gain the upper hand or if Congress tries to take action to kill this deal, they will not be uh, an integral part of this deal. The deal can survive even if Congress screws things up. So that's why I think it's been constructed 
in the way it has where the deal would have time to demonstrate that it can work and then hopefully the next president can deal with trying to convince Congress to lift the sanctions. A lot is uncertain in the negotiations right now. There are still big issues. And, you know, there's really, there's, there's two key issues that are holding up the talks as far as we know right now. That is preventing this political framework from being struck. The main one is UN sanctions. And that's because instead of lifting US sanctions, or even, we'll see, but the EU sanctions as well, there's talk about not lifting, but suspending the sanctions. But Iran has said, since we're building that into the deal, let's, they, they want to lift the UN sanctions. And the UN sanctions, you know, they're far more symbolic than practical. The real practical effect of sanctions has been the EU sanctions and the US sanctions. The UN sanctions provide sort of a legal framework for those sanctions, but lifting them is not necessarily going to provide Iran with all kinds of economic benefits or even any practical effects from this deal. It's symbolic. Mm -hmm. Hassan Rouhani was a critic of uh, the, the Ahmadinejad government because he said when he was negotiator for Iran before, you know, under the Khatami presidency, Iran made a lot of concessions, but they managed to keep the nuclear file out of the UN and, and, and managed to prevent UN sanctions from being passed. If he can get a deal that at least, at least lifts the UN sanctions, that's an important symbolic victory. But we're in a position now where there is some, and we can get into it later, but there is now some squabbling over, okay, how do we actually lift the UN sanctions? And this is because uh, we, can't, we can't really do that with Congress. Congress is such a, uh, is an actor that's not willing to move at the time, uh, at, at this time. Um, so, so that's where we are. It's unfortunate because I think that the United States could be asking for more if we could actually be credibly saying that Congress would do, uh, you know, do the president the honor of upholding a, an agreement that the U.S. struck. Um, and we also know that regardless of what happens at the talks in the next couple of days, Congress is poised to move forward with some form of legislation. If there's no deal, Congress is going to move forward with sanctions, new sanctions, um, sanctions that would violate the terms of the interim deal, um, would make it very difficult to use the remaining three months to try to cobble something together to salvage this process. If there is a deal, Congress is going to move forward likely uh, with legislation to try to shoehorn a congressional role into this process and essentially give Congress a veto over any deal. Now, just to close, I think the dynamics on Capitol Hill have changed over the past 18 months. And in recent weeks especially, um, the actions that the 47 senators uh, who signed this letter, this open letter to Iran, and just, you know, sort of an unprecedented, irresponsible move saying to Iran that we are not, you know, Congress is not going to honor what the United States uh, negotiators get at the, at the negotiating table. This combined with the controversial invitation to Netanyahu that was viewed as a very, you know, bald, partisan, politicized move. Again, a move without precedent. And, and some of the other jockeying, I think, has really um, created a dynamic on Capitol Hill where this is no longer viewed as through the, through the normal prism, where Anything attached to Iran, it's usually pretty easy to pass sanctions or take a hawkish position. Now, this is being viewed as, first of all, we have this deal that actually has been working, this interim deal that actually has worked over the past 18 months. But I think actually even more importantly, this is viewed as another one of Washington's political battles. Republicans versus Democrats, John Boehner and Mitch McConnell and, and GOP Republicans against President Obama. And because of this, I think that it's very likely that Congress, while they may pass legislation to, you know, insert themselves in this, pro in this process, it's going to be very difficult to override a presidential veto. So what this means is that in the near term, I think that the president will be able to continue to negotiate, will be able to stave off congressional action, and hopefully limit the damage that this does to our negotiators' sort of leverage at the table. But in the long term, it presents problems because eventually, if we get this deal, Congress is going to have to be a part of implementing it. And if this devolves into just pure partisan politics, it's hard to see a scenario where we get all the parties on board to actually implement a final deal. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to open up to your questions now. What's in it for Iran to negotiate this, especially with 
the brouhaha that Congress has mm -hmm. created, especially those 47 senators. Um, if I could just start that, maybe, John, you can, you can add. What's in it for Iran is that it gets relief from crippling sanctions, which have collapsed the economy of the country. Uh, and it, it sees an easing of its, uh, its pariah status. I mean, that's why Iran is there. John, would you, would you add? I, I would agree, more, I would agree uh, substanti uh, substantively with the second, mm -hmm. uh, that Iran, the, we're talking self-image now. Mm -hmm. um, Iran does not enjoy being um, the polecat of the international community, does not enjoy being seen like North Korea. Um, or Libya in the day, back in the day, uh, 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 back in the day, uh, that is not the way it views its uh, it views itself. So there's a, a political symbolic part of these of this that's very that's, that's very important. Second, uh, the second, the economic part of it um, is is arguable, uh, but I think the Iranians themselves uh, have taken the view that the sanctions have hurt us economically, therefore we need to negotiate our, our way out of them. Um, and in a way, that's easier than saying, you know what's really hurt our economy um, is our own mismanagement. Good evening. I'm Dr. Donna Schaefer from Marymount University here with about 20 students. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's any um, effects of social media or information flow on uh, this deal. So, you know, Iran is one of the most plugged in societies um, in, in the Middle East. Uh, uh, Iran, Iranians were among some of the first bloggers in the world. Um, and, you know, just to build off of the last question, uh, Iranians, you know, want to be connected. Uh, it's, it's a society that is, that is, uh, is all about, you know, embracing uh, neighbors and, 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 but social media, we know, I think really, sprang to the forefront of the Iran debate in 2009, during the Green Movement, uh, when I think probably for the first time, it's sort of debatable, but for the first time you saw people on Twitter um, uh, using Twitter as a, and social media as a form of, uh, you know, organizing, but more importantly sort of just getting the message out of what people were thinking and, and, and really uh, getting around the censorship of the government and, and all these things. Um, what was interesting at the time was that we actually had sanctions in place that prevented uh, uh, U.S. companies and many foreign companies from actually enabling Iranians to use their products. So, you know, there was the famous uh, uh, sort of incident in which uh, there, there were questions on fa among Facebook and Twitter, uh, you know, management folks about whether they could allow Iranians to be using those services. Iranians were using phones that in many cases were actually bought off the black market. They weren't actually sold through uh, normal channels because of sanctions. And the Obama administration has really responded to that. This has been one of the areas where they have taken action uh, to make sure that those sanctions weren't, uh, you know, having this really major unintended effect of, of blocking social media for Iranians. I think now, you know, you, you, just, you, you just go on any of the social media sites and you can see from Iran how, how much anticipation there is for this deal. Uh, you can cut through some of the rhetoric and see that, um, uh, you know, Iranians are waiting with bated breath for this thing. You have, you know, 80 million people trying to figure out if we have a deal or not and probably, you know, going through whiplash as, as this thing has, has progressed. Um, but, you know, I, I think the social media thing is very important, and I think that hopefully there are going to be more opportunities for those kind of connections, especially when there is a deal and sanctions get fully lifted, because even with what Ob the Obama administration has done, there are still significant barriers to having a real investment uh, by social media and tech companies in Iran. And Apple actually sort of went public and said as soon as there is a deal or as soon as they're able to, they will be going into Iran, which I think is just a major sign of all the potential that does exist there. We've recently seen uh, Saudi Arabia lead military strikes uh, against the uh, Houthi rebels in uh, Yemen. Um, with the Saudi-led interventionist policy, is that having any type of an impact on the current uh, talks? As far as I can tell, no. And both sides there seems to be, I, I don't know if it's explicit or implicit, 
uh, have agreed that uh, whatever goes on out there in the greater world, whether it's a letter from Congress, whether it's the Saudi action in Yemen, whether it's what goes on around Tikrit, around Tik uh, around Tikrit uh, they are not going to let that derail the, uh, derail the negotiations. And there's a good reason for it, because in the past, that's what always happened. Uh, I mean, one of the rules of U.S.-Iranian relations was uh, as soon as you start, as soon as you think you're making progress, uh, someone or something comes along to screw it up. And that's, so the, the decision, I think, there's, there's been a conscious decision. To, we're not going to let it happen this time. And um, uh, the Congress can write the letters that it wants. The Congress can write the letters that it wants. The Saudis can do what they want. The Iranians can do what, whatever they're doing in, Ye uh, in Yemen. And we're going to stay, we're going to, we're going to, uh, stay focused on the negotiations. But uh, Jamal, maybe you want to add something because obviously for Congress this is an issue. Yeah, and I actually, I you know, I think that the comments that you made about the nuclear program mm -hmm. for some in Iran being viewed as kind of a, a gateway to changing the dynamic and starting to open up to the United States, I think is really interesting here because this is, of course, this is a nuclear negotiation, but there is so much built into it that we are by necessity not discussing because this has been the, the main blockage towards actually engaging in, uh, in a dialogue. Uh, and I think that United States interests have not been served in some cases over the past 15 years, especially because we are not in a sustained dialogue uh, with Iran. We've been unable to uh, engage on issues we disagree on, like for instance, uh, potentially this, this Yemen situation, as well as areas where there's overlap, such as the situation with Iraq. Um, for Congress and here, you know, in the United States, I think that there are a few sort of sticks that are being used against our negotiators and against any deal, and one of them is that an Iran deal is going to, uh, is going to signal to our allies that we are shifting towards an alliance with the United States and sort of leaving them high and dry. Uh, which I think is, is untrue, uh, obviously. But this does start to lift some of the barriers that have entrenched this status quo where we're not talking to Iran, where we're unable to engage. And I think that does create fear for some of the powers in the region who really appreciate this status quo and, and want the, the maneuverability that it gives them to have the United States and Iran not engaging. And I think this potentially changes that. I'm Eleanor Bachrach. I worked in the Congress uh, back in the 70s, which now looks like the golden age. <laughs> uh, it's appalling what's happening now. I have a broad question and then a detailed one. The broad one is that I just can't fathom what Netanyahu and the various members of Congress think they're going to accomplish by uh, scuttling the whole deal. Uh, uh, it would seem to me they'd be much worse off. Is this purely posturing for domestic political reasons, uh, assuming that uh, uh, Obama will pull their uh, chestnuts out of the fire even though they won't acknowledge it? Uh, because otherwise, I, I don't understand it. It's, although it doesn't help that Iran has backed off of some of the things that it agreed to earlier, which uh, it's not good either. Uh, my s detailed question is, is, has there been any discussion of uh, renewing diplomatic relations uh, between the US and Iran if this does go through? Um. Do you want me to, you want to take a stab at the Israeli question, or shall I? <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just preface maybe your comments about what is, what is the strategy for Netanyahu if, if the talks get blown up. Um, but, you know, as far as Congress is concerned, I don't think that this is necessarily a strategic move by a lot of the folks who are opposing this deal. I don't know that there's really a, a next step. Um, there has been an avoidance or, or pushback on this notion that if we blow up this deal, we're going to go to war. Um, and nobody has provided an alternative. The alternative that's been provided other than war is a better deal. Well, a better deal is what they're trying to hammer out right now in Switzerland. So trying to oppose that deal, I don't, I don't know what the strategy would be if it fell apart. Yeah, I, you know, 
as we know, the, the relationship between Bibi Netanyahu and, and Barack Obama has been poor for a long time. And uh, the Israelis uh, were very, very upset back in 2013 to find out that the United States and Iran had been talking through a back channel, which was facilitated by Oman. Um, the Israelis felt that this was a real betrayal, that they were not read into these talks. I've been told this by Israeli officials. Um, and, uh, of course, the administration did that because they were worried about leaks. And uh, with all due admiration to, to my colleagues in the Israeli press, they have a way of finding out things and, and, and putting things out there. I remember uh, back in, I think it was 2000, there was a, a summit in, uh, in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, on Syria, uh, where an Israeli newspaper got a hold of the draft agreement and leaked the whole thing and, and blew up those talks, by the way. So there was no peace agreement between Israel and Syria. Um, anyway, for whatever reasons, the uh, Obama administration kept those negotiations quiet. And uh, the Israelis were upset about the interim agreement, although after it went into effect, uh, they, they didn't seem to mind quite so much. And what they envision is to keep that interim agreement in effect forever and to keep sanctions on forever with very, very limited relief uh, for Iran. But it's, it's unrealistic because the only reason the sanctions have worked is because they're multilateral. And the Europeans are not going to indefinitely, the Asians, indefinitely maintain these sanctions and stop buying Iranian oil. So, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. It's a delaying tactic. Maybe Netanyahu hopes he can somehow prevent an agreement until the next president comes in, and maybe that next president would be a Republican, more in tune with his views. Um, for now, I just see it as a, as a, a way of uh, exerting pressure to try to get uh, everyone to squeeze the last possible concession out of Iran. If and when there finally is a deal, uh, we may see a, a change, because I don't think Israel can afford to be uh, estranged from the United States forever. But for now, they're, they're really playing hardball. Uh, John, do you want to add anything? I, I just go to the second question. Mm -hmm. Go to the second question, um, which is not not that I know of. Uh, now there was talk, actually, at the end of the Bush administration, of uh, put sending American diplomatic personnel to a U.S. interest section in the Swiss embassy in Tehran. The Swiss have been our protecting power. They have they have had an interest there. They've uh, been the represented American interests there, but uh, since 1980, since 1980, uh, <coughs> since 1980, when relations were formally broken, but uh, there have been there are no American diplomatic personnel there. As there, for example, in the case of Cuba, there's a large interest section with a, a large staff of American diplomatic personnel who are also under Swiss, under formerly under the Swiss flag. With Iran, we're not there yet. Now, we, we're getting there with the, the Cuba case comes up. It's an interesting one because obviously the rule is um, no enmity goes on forever. You know, it, <coughs> at some time, things change. You know, we established relations with the Soviet Union less than 20 years after the Bolshevik, after the, after the Bolshevik res, uh, Revolution. With, with China, it took us a little longer, but not much. Not much long. It was twenty some years before Nixon went to China, uh, went, went to China. So the the possibility. I mean, it's one of those possibilities. Particularly if we can if something productive, something comes out of these talks, which both sides see as positive, because then they can say, "Hey, there's something in this for us," um, and that can lead on. My, I would make one prediction that once we once we get to that point where we're talking seriously, we're going to, both sides, I think, are going to ask themselves, what was all the fuss about? <laughs> Why did we waste so much time bashing the other side, uh, bashing the other side? But we're not there yet. The, it appears, uh, the question is, do we have a binary choice? Uh, do, can we be uh, engaged with Saudi Arabia and Iran productively? And we, we see the Saudis becoming more and more anxious, particularly with the engagement in Yemen, and then looking for U.S. Uh, support in what they're doing uh, from a Sunni perspective. 
And at this, so, so we're engaged in a, in a conflict with Iran on the one hand and in trying to negotiate with them on the other hand. So can we actually have a, a productive relationship on both sides of that fence? And if not, which side should we be on? Well, my personal view is that we can have a productive relationship with both and that the more relationships we have, the more options it gives us uh, diplomatically so we don't have to necessarily rely on traditional allies and we have new channels. Uh, obviously, this makes the Saudis very uncomfortable. Uh, but the Saudis, of course, see the region in sectarian terms. They go back to 2003 when the Bush administration got rid of Saddam Hussein and changed the, the sectarian balance in the region and essentially uh, gave Iran influence in Iraq that it had not had in, you know, 300 years. Um, so uh, I, I think it is possible. It's not easy. And uh, that's one of the reasons you see the uh, sort of seeming inconsistency in U.S. policy where the United States is providing intelligence help and so on to the Saudis in Yemen. At the same time, it's providing intelligence help to the Iraqi government and the Iranians indirectly to, uh, to recapture Tikrit and presumably soon uh, Mosul in, in Iraq. Um, I don't know, John, you can talk better about whether diplomacy has to be consistent. I don't think it does. No, I, I practiced it. I, I, you know, I was in the Foreign Service for 30, 34, 35 years. Um, I guess I was what you call a diplomat. Uh, my wife would laugh if, if, if uh, she heard me described that way. But uh, no, there is there there isn't any. I mean, diplomacy is really making it's making imperfect deals with dubious partners. It's really what it is. People you don't like or trust. People you don't like or trust. And at one point, I mean, the Saudi and the Saudis know this. The Saudis have never broken relations with Iran. They're not friends with the Iranians, but they've never broken relations. And when necessary, they will talk. Uh, and they have a lot of things to talk about. Uh, uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, the, oil, the world oil market, the Hajj, the, the, the holy sites. A um, lot of things to talk, a lot, lot of things to talk. And they will, and they do, and they do. Uh, it is not, and the other point is that in Yemen, uh, historical irony in Yemen, um, People who tell you it's a, it's a sectarian thing, it's Sunni against, uh, against Shia, may forget that back in the 60s, the Saudis were uh, supporting the Zaidi Shiite royalists against the Nasserists there. Uh, it was not, in those days, it was not in sectarian, it's not always in sectarian terms. So there are larger interests at play or other interests in, uh, at play, and I would say be wary of those who try to pr boil it down to one issue. It's sectarian, it's Arab versus Persian, it's this, it's this or that. There are a lot of factors in play, and it's what makes diplomacy, one, so difficult, but also so interesting at the same time. Uh, in, in Yemen, it's also an effort by the former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, to uh, return to power right. and to get revenge on the Saudis who have tried four times to eliminate him and <laughs> failed. Uh, so yeah, it's Iran plays a role, but uh, probably Ali Abdullah Saleh and the portion of the Yemeni military that is close to him plays a bigger role. Uh, let me just add one quote. This is from Richard Armitage, a former Deputy Secretary of State with a very salty tongue right. and, and a great way of putting things. He said, diplomacy is the art of getting the other guy to have your way. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's best practice with adversaries, yeah, exactly. indeed. And, and the French, but I'm not sure which they are. Um, yes. Uh, my name is Jim Moran. I missed the... Welcome. Oh, well, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it, the, uh, I, I wasn't physically present here at the beginning because I've been sitting in my car listening on C-SPAN uh, radio to the <laughs> panel, and I didn't want to miss any of it. Uh, but in addition to the shout-out for C-SPAN covering it, uh, the World Affairs Council deserves a major shout out for uh, such an extraordinarily timely and substantive uh, panel discussion. Uh, and uh, they, they found three people who really know what they're talking about, um, as opposed, unfortunately, to some of my former colleagues in the Congress, whose, 
<laughs> some of whom I'm not sure know the difference between a Shi and Sunni, and certainly don't understand that Iran is, is not an Arab state, but has been a, a anyway, we're not going to get into that, uh, but 35 years is a relative blip in the history of American-Iranian relations, which has been extraordinarily positive. In fact, uh, that's probably uh, why this, uh, uh, the um, surveys that have been shown show a residual positive attitude towards the United States higher than the surrounding nations towards uh, uh, America and Americans. Uh, it's, uh, it, it really is somewhat uh, ironic given the fact that the, uh, the Congress is, is so uh, uh, hostile and uh, of course I think we all understand it's, it's a very short-term politically inspired position on the part of, uh, of a number of them. But, so my question, my request uh, would be to look into the future understanding that every nation in the Middle East is in a politically, possibly economically unsustainable position. Possible exception of Oman, maybe Morocco, but for the most part, none of this can last where we are today. So where do you think we might be 10 years from now? What's your best uh, prognosis. <laughs> and if you want, you can just tell us where you think we should be. But, but really, uh, this, this can't last where we are today. Where are we likely to be tomorrow? Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Co Congressman. And uh, Congressman Moran actually uh, helped pass legislation to help lift those sanctions on uh, communications technology for Iranians and has been a great friend of And the Howard Berman was a great help in that, I have to Absolutely. say. Absolutely. Uh, in 10 years, you know, since we're here to talk about the nuclear, the nuclear deal, we're looking at a deal that is going to last 10 to 15 years. Um, and then, you know, while the inspections and all, you know, those will stay in place, the restrictions on Iran's nuclear program will go away, uh, the, the limitations. And so I think that this, this deal is really a challenge to, in the next 10 to 15 years, start to redefine the relationship between the U.S and Iran, in order for this thing to actually stick, in order for it to actually fulfill the promise uh, that many of us see in this diplomatic endeavor, there does have to be a change in the relationship between the U.S. and Iran, and there has to be uh, an integration of interests between the countries. I would hope that going to the conversation about the role of the, the Saudis and this sort of regional balance of power, I would hope that there is some effort immediately after this deal gets done, if it gets done, to start figuring out positive some approaches to the, to, to, the, to the region. How do we have the actors in the region actually cooperating with one another so that every move is not I win, you lose, but there's actually things that countries can do together to, I mean, first let's start talking about putting together some of the you know, enormous ruptures in the area. I mean, whether it's Syria or Yemen or Iraq, how do you actually get the parties to the table to start talking about mutual interests and resolving these issues? And, mm -hmm. And then, you know, there are also probably other areas for collaboration to be explored. But I really think that the onus is on everybody who supports this deal to figure out over these next 10 years, how do we do that? And how do we ensure that at the end of this deal, we're in a different place than we are today, where we don't have to worry about the next diplomatic, you know, uh, disaster and, and, and trying to put Band-Aids over the situation? Yeah, Congressman, let me th thank you for your kind words and your, go and your good work. There's also, a f uh, I would mention, a fellow Northern Virginian, uh, Ambassador Beyer. Yes, Don's uh, terrific. <laughs> he did a ter tremendous job as ambassador to Switzerland. And I'm saying this as a career officer. I'm not supposed to say this about political appointees, but... Um, I'm not supposed to say what I said about the Congress. So, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> exactly. But and I didn't mean it to apply to everybody by any means, obviously. But, but <laughs> as ambassador to Switzerland, you know, Iran became a big part of his portfolio, and he was, did an outstanding job, did an outstanding yes. job, and was very helpful to me when I was back in, uh, back in, the, in the State Department. He's back a great in asset. 2010. But uh, predict, you know, pre this is this prediction is tough. My my record of prediction on Iran is terrible. Uh, everything, I mean, w when we got out of Tehran in, in left Tehran in, in 1981, uh, I thought five years, ten years down the line, tempers would cool, 
uh, we would at least be able to talk to each other. Uh, we wouldn't be friends, but we could talk to each other. Well, I was wrong there. I was there wrong was about Iran that. Contra. Pardon? There was Iran-Contra. Let's not forget that. Mm -hmm. that uh, was yeah, but if after. that's the way we're going to do it, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's really not, well, I, I won't. That also connects to the Naval Academy, by the way, um, Iran-Contra, but I won't get, into that, won't, won't get into that part of it. But um, we, did, we didn't do it. So, ten, but I, here, here's what I would, I would say. One is there's a dynamic in, in there's, I think there's a dynamic going on inside Iran that has nothing to do with us, but that will affect the relationship, and that is this growing distance between s s the state and the society. The society is progressive, it's active, it's creative, it's, sa it's savvy, it's well-educated, particularly the women. I mean, if you look at things that are coming out of Iran, uh, 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 what people are doing in Iran, and then the state, um, what can I say? It's just um, the opposite. <laughs> it's just the opposite. It's it's rigid. It's inflexible. It's afraid. It's it's a, it's afraid. It's over it o overreacts. I don't know how long that situation can last. I don't think it can. Mm -hmm. uh, is it going to change tomorrow? Probably not. Uh, uh, probably not. As much as uh, as much as maybe I would like to see that, and my Iranian many of my Iranian friends would like to see would like to see that. Uh, but over five ten over five ten years, I don't think the situation as is today is tenable. I think there's a change going on. Now, um, we ought to stay out of it because when we start mucking around in uh, Iranian internal politics, we usually get it wrong. Uh, Iran Contra is a good example of that. Is a is, is a good example of that. Um, but it will affect us, and will affect our uh, it will affect our relationship. So I think that's I think it's, I think that change is coming. Uh, but, you know, when and how, I'm not sure. Thank if you. I could just okay. add, Congressman, um, one thing that we can do is, is promote U.S.-Iran exchanges uh, so that we can stop, we can get to know each other again after all these years. And I think there are already something like 10,000 Iranian students in the United States, mm -hmm. which is a steady increase uh, over the last few years. Now, it's not the 50,000 who came every year when the Shah was in power, but it's, it's a good start. And I would hope that more Americans also will go to Iran as tourists, as students. It's a gorgeous country. There's a lot to see, uh, tremendous uh, historical artifacts, beautiful cities, beautiful countryside, and fabulous food. So, um, you know, I think that we, we saw, we had a little bit of this honeymoon with China, you remember, in the 80s when people wanted to go to China and they were fascinated by it. If we can get this nuclear deal, if things sort of stabilize on that front, I think you will see uh, a lot more of this kind of interchange back and forth, and that would be very healthy. Um, we've come to the end. Uh, we want to thank you all so much uh, for coming tonight, and I hope we answered some of your questions, and uh, we will see what happens in the coming days. It should be very interesting. Yeah? Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.